All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Those who are new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live uh, into classrooms across North America and beyond. So we couldn't be more excited for the start uh, of a new school year. It's going to be an interesting school year. We'll have classrooms joining us um, from the class, we'll have classrooms joining us from home, uh, and a mixture of the two, as well as lots of family groups joining us. So we're really excited uh, for the year ahead. We couldn't be excited with today's, uh, more excited about today's live virtual connection. So we love getting in, into the field when we can, and we are partnered uh, with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Stell Wagon uh, Bank National Marine Sanctuary for an incredible series of events over the next three days. We are doing live exploration of shipwrecks in the field um, in real time every day starting today at 11 30 a.m eastern so broadcasting live to facebook uh, and youtube and also bringing in some groups to join us live as we explore the wreck of the portland as well as a mystery unidentified schooner so it's going to be lots of fun uh, for these events i'm now going to turn things over to hannah mcdonald she is live at the inner space station in rhode island she's an education specialist with noah's Office of National Marine Sanctuary. Hannah, it's so great to see you uh, live with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. And I am super excited to have all of your groups across North America joining us today, either on video feed or on YouTube. As Joe said, I'm Hannah McDonald. I'm the Education Specialist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Today, I'm located at the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island. Also on screen today, you are going to meet our research team located in Situate, Massachusetts, which happens to be Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary's headquarters. But even more exciting, we are going to bring in a live remotely operated vehicle feed coming to you from the shipwreck Portland inside of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. In fact, you can see it on screen right now. Now this model of bringing the ship's feed to the scientists on shore and then broadcasting out to all of you is what we call telepresence. And it's what's allowing us to continue making discoveries and continue ocean exploration during this national health crisis. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries are committed to continuing ocean exploration and being leaders in ocean science while following all of the local, state, and federal guidelines throughout this pandemic. I'm here in mission control all alone, so I won't need to wear my mask and I get to share my smile with all of you. The team located in Situate, they're also all outside, all far apart from one another, so they're able to connect to you without wearing a mask as well. Now with that, this interaction also includes all of you out there. So Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce your groups who are on camera. And if you are tuning in either on YouTube or Facebook, why don't you test out the comments or chat section by letting us know where you're from. We'll run an introduction package to this program after that. So we'll then review the comments. But Joe, where is your group tuning in from? All right, excellent. Well, like you said, Facebook and YouTube, we'd love to see those comments come in. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We'll do some shout outs. But I'm really excited for today's uh, group who are joining us. We've got a few classrooms that are joining us who are back to school already. We've got uh, Ms. Rapier's third graders are joining us from Clemens, North Carolina. So we'll definitely spend a little time getting to know them. We've got Ms. Uh, Camarina's group. They're joining us from Compton, California, some fifth graders. We're excited to take their questions. And we've got some great family groups who are tuning with us uh, today as well. We've got some families in New Jersey, in Virginia, in Woodbridge, uh, in Ipswich, Massachusetts, as well as Chevy Chase, uh, Maryland. So lots of great uh, groups tuning in. We're really excited to take their questions. That's super exciting. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you all from all across the country for tuning in. We're excited for your questions. I'm gonna turn it over to a little bit of a sneak peek about the project, both last year and what happened this summer before I turn it over to the research team in Situate. Up to 600 feet deep, the final resting place of hundreds of shipwrecks and one of the top 10 whale watching destinations in the world. Located 25 miles off Boston, 
Still Lake and Bank National Marine Sanctuary is home to a rich assortment of marine life, including Atlantic cod, haddock, flounder, bluefin tuna, and many species of whales, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Stellwagen Bank also contains vast numbers of shipwrecks, ranging from wooden sailing ships to modern fishing trawlers. These wrecks are both windows into the past and important habitats for marine life. Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary is one of 16 marine protected areas within the National Marine Sanctuary System, a network of more than 600,000 square miles of underwater parks. Managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the sanctuaries promote responsible, sustainable use of ocean and Great Lakes resources. To foster the public's connection with the ocean, NOAA awarded funding to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, often referred to as HUI, to conduct state-of-the-art research. Based on nearby Cape Cod, Kui is the world's oldest and largest nonprofit ocean research and education institution. In 2019, tools and technologies pioneered by Hui and their partner, Marine Imaging Technologies, let us share high resolution images and interact with viewers in real time. This year, those same remote tools allow us to carry on our work during the pandemic. In early March, we added innovative microwave technology that beams data to shore, providing faster communication and better images. And we adapted our research model to include a smaller crew at sea and broad distribution to partners on land. COVID-19 has changed many aspects of our lives, but with careful preparation, social distancing and technology, we can safely continue researching the ocean floor and sharing our discoveries in real time with you. Awesome. Thank you so much for typing in where you're from. We have people spanning from all over, from Alabama to Virginia to California. So thank you for letting us know where you are from. In this chat and comments area, this is also where you'll be able to submit your questions throughout the program to our research team. So if you have one, think of it, type it in then, and we'll address it in the question and answer time at the end of the program. And with that, I am ready to turn it over to Ben Heskel, Deputy Superintendent of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Now he's going to give us a bit of an overview of the shipwrecks of Stellwagen Bank, especially the Portland, the one we were viewing on the live feed earlier. Hi, Ben. Hey, hi, Hannah. Thanks very much. And thanks to all of you folks out there uh, watching this return uh, to the wreck of the passenger steamship Portland which is the sanctuary's most famous and iconic shipwreck. She was lost way back in 1898 uh, in the perfect storm of the 19th century, named the Portland Gale after the ship. 192 passengers uh, lost their lives in this tra tragedy. Um, and the ship was leaving Boston on the at 7 p.m. right on time uh, the night of uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving uh, for the overnight trip to Portland. So the passengers would um, sleep on their way to their uh, destination in Portland. Well, they never arrived the next the next morning. The mystery of the Portland's loss and location lasted for almost a century. <clears throat> but in 1989. Two uh, shipwreck explorers and a oceanographer from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution located the ship, or what they thought was the Portland. Uh, and then in 2002, um, uh, sanctuary researchers, uh, as well as a team from Undersea Research Center at UConn, uh, confirmed that in fact this wreck was the Portland. Now, with new technologies, uh, we will unveil some of her secrets about her sinking, uh, what, what's happened to her since then. Um, and unlike this uh, physical model that I have here bes beside me, we can now make 
uh, 3D virtual models uh, based on the imagery that we're collecting. And you'll see that in a, in a little bit. We know that Portland went down the morning after she departed. Um, and after battling um, huge storm waves overnight, she sank uh, the next morning. Um, and because we, we know this because of her, um, her location and the winds and the currents and the tides uh, at the time. Um, and you can only imagine how frightened the passengers must have been as this, this ship was overcome with giant 30 and 40 foot waves. The, the Portland was a side paddle wheel steamer. You can see the side paddle here. Um, and she was quite unfit uh, and unstable for rough ocean crossings. She had a, uh, a, a flat bottom and the side paddle wheels were, were meant for river travel. Uh, finally, you know, the ship was swamped with these giant waves and, um, and, and the hull was, was uh, flooded and she sank and went to the bottom. Everyone on board was lost. Uh, as we look back at this, um, at this model, um, we uh, last year determined that there was a, uh, a large trawl net, a new trawl net uh, draped over the port bow. We were able to see some teacups and plates um, uh, and other artifacts in the area of the galley back here. And um, what we hope to achieve this year is, um, is getting more imagery of the wreck as well as penetrating into the engine, engine room area, which is in this area, with um, our small mini ROV, which we call TAS. Um, so uh, for Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, um, the, the finding, documenting, and protection of these historic shipwrecks and artifacts is one of our uh, primary missions. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, the seafloor in the sanctuary is actually covered with well over 47 uh, shipwrecks that we know about, and there are many, many more that have yet to be uh, discovered and named. Um, and what um, what I'd like to do now is introduce our, um, our project archaeologist, Dr. Calvin Myers, and he is going to help us interpret um, the, the live feed that you're seeing on your screen um, and uh, answer some of the questions that are coming up. Like last year, um, we not only found this, uh, this net draped on the, on the port bow of the Portland, but we found possibly a uh, connecting arm back here that um, helped propel the ship forward. And so we're trying to determine why did the Portland sink? What caused her ultimate demise? And so Calvin uh, is going to help us interpret that. And uh, so why don't you uh, take it away, Calvin? Great, Ben. Thank you for that introduction and welcome um, all students and uh, families out there. My name is Dr. Calvin Myers. I'm with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and I'm a marine ar archaeologist. And uh, as Ben was describing, you know, we're trying to piece together those final moments of what happened on that terrible night of November 26th and 27th of 1898. And we have to use technology because our, our shipwreck is 500 feet below the ocean. And if we just went down and took pictures, that's one thing, but that's not what we want to do. We want to bring it to you. And the way we do that is with a 3D model, which I believe we have a, a sample of what we're trying to do. This is a kind of a process that um, we are, are developing through with something called photogrammetry. And on your screens right now, you should be seeing kind of a fly through. This is our ROV, what it did went around the starboard side and you might see things like the trawl net that Ben was talking about. Um, you might see some other nets. If you look really closely, as we get to the back of the ship, we're going from the front to the back, you will see some artifacts, some plates, maybe a cup, maybe something that looks like a hoop, but it's a bent pipe. And if you look really closely, you might even see a little red fish in there. That's the quality 
that we're um, that we're able to reproduce with the technology at our at our hands. And um, one of the goals of all of this is to do a virtual excavation to be able to take scientists, managers, as well as classrooms below the sea to do a virtual dive to try to piece together and. We did a great job last year, but we've even built further on that where we're able to get, as Ben was talking about, um, the engine area. There's this huge 30 foot walking beam. It's like an Eiffel Tower at the top with a seesaw that made pivot, kind of went back and forth and pistons were driving and turned the paddle wheels and it could get up to 15 knots and it was what made everything go, but it might've broken. And that's what we were interested in this year is to see if we could actually identify parts of that walking beam that might have fallen apart and you know what we did we were able to get in through pixel that we'll see here in a little bit uh and see that there's a crank arm that fell off kind of you know if you think of your shoulder just unfortunately a bad injury and maybe that stopped the paddle wheel or maybe that was a secondary cause and maybe they just ran out of fuel currently we have a rov out there right now checking out trying to get into the places that we couldn't with our bigger rovs to see if they ran out of fuel through their coal bunkers if they're empty kind of like a train locomotive and one of the key aspects of all of this isn't just about the ship but really to tell the story of the people on board the passengers and the crew and if we think of the current so circumstances of covid 19 and the pandemic we have a much deeper appreciation of what it means to be an essential worker such as um, Eben Houston, who was a steward, African-American steward from Portland, who uh, was on board and probably comforting. He was essential. He, they, passengers turned to him looking for comfort. And there was reports that he went down with his wife and child. Well, those ports were inaccurate. It's one of the reasons why it's difficult to get an accurate count of passengers and crew on board. But I'm glad it was inaccurate because the great grandmother, um, of or even Houston's wife was a great grandmother of a good friend of mine named Bob Green, who's a descendant, of one of the victims of the Portland. And I was just talking to him last night about this story and he's seen pictures and he's able to take a look at where his great grandfather would have been helping people. And it was very fascinating, and interesting to him. And he told me a story about how the motto of Portland, the city is the Phoenix because it's been burned three times. And from the ashes, it's always risen. And you, on the Portland, there was a seal of a phoenix. And so through technology, we're bringing this shipwreck rising from the ashes, just like the phoenix does. We're very excited, but that is why we need technology and the best cutting uh, edge uh, minds and engineers out there. And I believe, Hannah, you have a package that could help uh, our great students out there learn more about how we're doing this and bringing it to them. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Myers, for sharing those wonderful stories that the technology we've been using on this project has led us to. Before I run the little video that tells us a little bit more about the technology, I want you to start thinking of questions for our a biologist that's working on this project. We'll introduce you to her after this. So Joe, I'll turn it over to you after this video to bring up one of your classrooms or student groups that might have a question for Dr. Meyer Kaiser, the biologist. Deep sea research and exploration are completely dependent on technology to go where humans can't. At Stellwagen Bank, we use a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, named Pixel to take pictures and video around shipwrecks. Pixel is relatively small, a fraction the size of deep sea ROVs. But sometimes we need something even smaller to advance our scientific goals, a penetration vehicle. This year, Marine Imaging Technologies built one, the Portland Penetration Explorer, or PPE, designed to go inside shipwrecks. PPE hitches a ride to the wreck on Pixel, then flies off and explores places even Pixel can't go. Looking inside the Portland helps us gather more information about her final moments. PPE's wide-angle, low-light 4K camera captures images from deep inside, where light is often scarce. These same images will let us build a future VR experience based around the Portland. 
One of our biggest technological changes this year is not underwater, but in air. Telepresence typically involves broadcasting via satellite or VSAT. But VSAT equipment is large, heavy, costly, and poorly suited to small vessels. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're operating with a reduced crew on a much smaller boat, the Catapult. We needed a solution that provided real-time communication to partners on land, but that Catapult could still fit and operate. So we partnered with AV Watch, who provide high bandwidth communications for the U.S. Coast Guard, Air Force, and Navy. They pioneered a new way of using microwave broadcast technology, pairing small, stabilized transmitters at sea with equally small receivers on land, or even on a plane. Their technologies provide high bandwidth data at a fraction of VSAT's cost, letting us send multiple real-time video feeds to our team ashore and helping everyone stay safe. I don't know about all of you, but I'm super thankful for this microwave technology that allows us to connect. So Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you to let one of your classrooms ask a question to Kirsten. All right, excellent. Well, first I wanna give a shout out to everybody who's making this uh, call possible today. It is, um, you know, we did this last year, it was a ton of fun, but just the technology in one year, uh, the change, being able to bring the, the wreck live. It's incredible to be able to see this history and then learn from some of the archeologists and uh, the biologists in real time. So we are going to do a quick check-in and see if there are any uh, questions, biology questions about the marine life with some of our groups. So first of all, to start, I am going to pop in um, the Haynes family. So they are joining us uh, from Woodbridge, Virginia. Uh, so let's pop them in and see if they have a question for us. There we go. Um, Haynes family, how you doing? Okay, maybe they're not ready uh, with the mute. You are on mute, so you just need to pop off uh, if you want. Oh, right. Got me now? There we go. Hey, Haynes family. Hey, um, well, you've only got one of me. I'm, I'm dad from Dubai in the UAE, and the boys are watching via Zoom on the same screen um, over in Woodbridge. Uh, we are a COVID-divided family at the moment. Um, but we're just thinking, I mean, 500 feet down is quite deep, right? So not much sunlight. So earlier this year, we were talking about primary energy sources in the deep, um, when we were talking about deep sea smokers and such like. Um, so what's the, uh, the primary energy source down here? That's a great question. And I think we will now turn it over to Dr. Meyer Kaiser. She's the most qualified to answer it as she is the biologist on this mission. So I'm gonna turn it over to Situate, Massachusetts to Dr. Kirsten Meyer Kaiser to tell us more about the biology and address this question about the lack of sunlight reaching the Portland. Thank you very much, Hannah. And let me just say how excited I am to have someone tuning in from Dubai. That's really exciting for us. Um, so. That is a great question because it is so deep, but I'll tell you that ultimately the energy that the animals are consuming on the shipwreck is still derived from photosynthetic sources. So it ultimately comes from the sun. There's a mechanism called marine snow, which is where all of the dead phytoplankton and animals from the surface kind of rain down on the sea floor. And we have a lot of our animals eating that as their primary food source. They just filter out whatever is in the water column and are able to eat that. So this year for the Portland, I really wanted to dive into the next level of analysis. Last year, I spent a lot of time telling our audiences about that just kind of basic level of what is on the wreck. But this year, I wanted to get into that deeper. And so I'm looking at patterns in the biological community on the shipwreck. And so far, I've made some pretty cool findings. On the Portland, it's really stratified. At the top, you have all of those sessile suspension feeders, those animals that are just filtering particles or small animals 
animals out of the water column as their food source. They like to be on the top of the wreck, especially on the walking beam, which is the highest point on the wreck. It's all about elevation. So the higher up they can get off the seafloor, the more food source they're exposed to. So we see dense clusters of anemones and sponges up on the top of the wreck. Lower down, for example, at the base of the walking beam and especially inside the wreck, we don't see quite as much because there isn't that suspended food source, but still there are animals that are able to make their home there. So we see some mobile predators, for example, spider crabs and sea stars that are living inside or at the bottom of the wreck. And fish really love to be inside the wreck in the little nooks and crannies. They use that structure as a habitat for protection from their predators and places where they can have their young be protected. So Shipwrecks are actually really essential habitat. And the more I research this, the more I realize just how critical they are because we see some species on the wrecks that we don't see on the natural hard bottom habitats. For example, those anemones that are so abundant on the walking beam. So I'm really excited to continue our research this summer. Getting inside the wreck has been especially informative for us. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Hannah. to a live feed from the Portland to see if we can address any of the biology features that Kirsten just mentioned. So if we can bring up the live feed from the Portland, that would be fantastic. And while we're doing that, if you wanna start thinking about the questions that you have to ask our research team, you can type them in to the chat box. If you're on video, you can raise your hand and Joe will call on you. We're about to t turn it over to question and answer time, but I don't know about you, I wanted another chance to see the Portland live. All right, it's really cool. You can really see the marine snow uh, coming down when you look at the live image and how that provides so much food for so many organisms, that, that organic material slowly making its way down to the bottom. Really cool. All right, what do you think, Hannah? Should we work in a few questions from uh, the live feeds now and from our live groups? There's definitely lots of questions coming in. Yeah, I definitely think so, Joe. I think it's up to you whether you want to call on a classroom or someone from YouTube or Facebook. I see a lot of questions coming in. This is great. All right. So I do want to give a few little shout outs while we're getting started. We've got Lancaster, Pennsylvania. A big shout out to Miss Rickards, fourth graders hanging out with us in Tucson, uh, Arizona. Hey, Chloe and Paxton in Waterloo. Miss Richardson's back in action in Hoover, Alabama. Uh, so we'll give a few more shout outs a little bit later, but it's great to see um, so many groups joining in, including Mrs. Daly's third graders are in Tucson. Uh, Arizona as well. That's great going coast to coast with this live event. So let's start off with one via uh, YouTube. So Sherry's here. Uh, so this is a question near and dear to me. You can tell by the shirt I'm wearing today. Sherry wants to know, are there any sharks? Did you Have you seen any sharks around the wreck? Are there any species of sharks we can find uh, around the wreck? I believe that's a great question for Dr. Meyer Kaiser. So Kirsten, they want to know if there are any sharks in or around the wreck. There are actually uh, spiny dogfish are very common in the sanctuary. And we had one that was swimming in front of ROV Pixel um, as we were doing our research. That was really cool to see. There are definitely spiny dogfish sharks uh, in and around the Portland. Awesome. Thank you, Kirsten. Joe, let's take another question. All right. Let's get a voice in here. I'm going to go to Miss uh, Camarina. She's representing her group in Compton, California. Uh, let's say hi to her and let's grab uh, a question from her group. So she's in the stream now. Hey, Miss Camarina, how are you? Hi, good morning. My fifth graders are watching and they're super excited to be live with you. All right. I, Very I, cool. I, named Carlos who has a question. Go ahead, Carlos. Do I talk? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what kind of fish were over there? 
That is a great question, Carlos. And another one for Kirsten. Carlos wants to know what kind of fish are over there. Probably the ones he's maybe been seeing on the live feed. Yes, yeah, so the most common fish around the Portland is the Acadian redfish. The scientific name is Sebastes fasciatus. And those have actually been really abundant um, on all of the shipwrecks we've been seeing in the sanctuary. They like to hang around near artificial reef environments such as shipwrecks. And uh, there's actually a really high abundance of them this year, much more than previous years of research, back when um, our partners from Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary were doing research between 2002 and 2010. There used to be more cod and pollock on the wrecks, but the Acadian redfish definitely dominate right now. All right, great question. So I am going to ask a question on behalf of uh, Miss Rapier's class, they are joining us in Clemens, North Carolina. They're live in the call, but you know, as we know, we're all adjusting to a new back to school with, with COVID. They're all tuning in via Zoom and uh, their teachers joining us live in the call. And Maddie B is really wanting to know um, how the wreck of the Portland was discovered in the first place. After it sank, how was it discovered? Who found it? That is a great question. That's a great question for Deputy Superintendent Ben Haskell. So Ben, we're gonna turn it over to you. How was the Portland first discovered? Yeah, that is a great question. So in, um, in 1989, it was discovered by two sort of avocational shipwreck explorers, John Fish and Arnie Carr. And they had spent about 10 years of their own time and money up to 1989 searching for this, um, for the elusive Portland. And uh, finally, they, with the help of an oceanographer at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, um, they were able to backtrack based on time and tides and currents and the fact that the uh, wristwatches that um, on, on human bodies that washed up on Cape Cod were stopped at nine, um, and nine o'clock, it turns it turns out that that was nine uh, a.m. And so, knowing that time plus the tides and the currents, um, they were able to sort of backtrack to a um, a general location of where the Portland might be. And they put down a um, a side scan sonar, um, which uh, returns images from the seafloor using sound and they found a very large um, object. Uh, it looked, was sort of the shape of a ship, and uh, they weren't able to positively identify it as the Portland, uh, but they were pretty sure that they, that they found it. And, um, and subsequently, uh, I asked Arnie if he would tell me where, where it was, uh, because they had run out of time and money to um, to continue their search. So they kind of handed it over to, uh, to the sanctuary and its partners, and we were able to confirm its identity as, as that of the Portland. That's a fantastic story. And we're thankful for John Fish and Arnie Carr for that discovery. Joe, do we have any other questions? We do. So we've got, this is a great question from Sunil, who's wondering about um, the exploration you're doing right now, do we know if that has, uh, you know, an impact on some of the organisms that have made the wreck their home? That's another great question for Dr. Meyer Kaiser. Kristen, uh, do these human explorations disturb the organisms in any way? Well, we certainly make every effort to not disturb the organisms that we're studying. We want to keep them as they are in situ, undisturbed, and not have any lasting impacts on their communities. So we take every effort um, that we possibly can to ensure that. So a couple of interactions uh, between some of the organisms and the ROV have happened, but mostly the fish seem curious about what is this alien thing with all the bright lights and the, you know, 
turbulent thrusters. And so we actually um, have some of the fish that swim around the ROV in kind of their own exploration. We had, for example, one cusk um, that really liked swimming in front of the camera and kind of performing for us. So we try absolutely to leave the organisms as they are. In fact, when we collected some biological specimens earlier this summer using a suction sampler on Pixel, we went to a bottom, uh, a hard bottom site with just boulders so that we could collect there and not disturb the animals on the wreck. Um, but yeah, so the fish seem a little curious, but other than that, we try to stay as uh, low impact as possible. All right, very cool and a great question. So just a reminder to those tuning in via Facebook and YouTube, uh, any questions, fair game now, biology, archaeology, history. It's so great that we have this awesome team uh, assembled working with uh, such great partners uh, like Hui, Noah's offices of Marine National uh, Sanctuaries. It's a lot of, of fun. So I do want to give a shout out. I can see Elias and uh, Maritza are joining us live as well. So give me a wave if you want me to pop you in. If you guys have a question, we can bring you in. Uh, we have a couple students from Compton who joined in right uh, into those camera spots. But I know there's a couple more questions. So I'm going to bring uh, Miss Camarina back into the stream here. Hi, yes. We have <laughs> another question from Joseph M. Go ahead, Joseph. Um. How deep was the ship when you first found it? Was that question, how deep was the ship when we first found it? Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna say, let's turn this one over to Dr. Myers. Kelvin, how deep was the ship when they first found it? Would there be anything that could happen to change a depth of a shipwreck? Question, and this one sits pretty deep. It's over uh, 400 feet, um, and uh, we I said earlier, you know, even over 500. So there's quite a bit of things that happen at that depth that um, are are challenging. First of all, the water pressure at that to go down is almost undivable. And we take these underwater robots to get down there, and we have to be very careful because what we found are um, nets kind of uh, strewn about all over the place. This is an active fishing um, ground and, you know, the, the uh, fishermen don't want to lose their equipment and this becomes kind of a natural hazard uh, or actually a cultural hazard. So it, those nets can pull and drag and actually rip apart the shipwreck. And one of the things that we need to do is go in and try to determine those kind of site formation processes, Hannah, and it's really a challenge at that depth. If you think about it, it's really looking through just a small little window of, uh, of kind of like a binocular in the dark, 500 feet deep. Um, it's pretty challenging, but a lot of fun to do as well. Great question. Absolutely. And I'm loving the feed from the ROV right now. We've got some curious marine life. Um, you know, it's so great to be taken to another world uh, in this way and never have to, to leave your seat almost. It's pretty darn cool. So that uh, brings up a really good question. ND is joining us and they're wondering about how does doing what you're doing right now help impact research in the future, whether it's biology or shipwrecks, or can we learn lessons that can help us in future construction of ships and things like that? So that is a great question. I think I'm going to turn this Again, over to Dr. Myers. Kelvin, how does shipwreck exploration help research for the future? Well, one lesson that was really learned almost immediately, uh, again, the Portland sank in 1898. And we don't know how many passengers and crew were on there because they had a list, but was on the ship that went. So we lost that record. And one of the things that uh, seafaring companies did immediately after was to make sure there was a copy of the passengers and the crew, both not only on the ship, but at the port from which they left. So when these tragedies happen, uh, you would actually have a record because there was a lot of confusion. And if you can imagine getting reports of losses of loved one, it was very traumatic as they went through. So one of the first things we always do is, uh, you know, improve on these mistakes. And one thing studying shipwrecks teaches is that humans have made mistakes um, for a long time. And how do we improve on each of those? When technology fails, when um, things don't go the right way, how do we keep evolving and 
improving on the design so we're as safe as possible. And these types of studies really are the um, predecessors for things like GPS and even our smartphones today. There is a need to make sure we're uh, as in touch as possible with the uh, sailors and crew out at sea today. In fact, it's a bit of a stretch to say that Portland led us to the technology of the pixel that we're looking at, but we're certainly using the technology of today to understand the technology of the past. So it's pretty kind of a really great circle of understanding both human behavior, 1898 and today in 2020. All right, great question. I'm gonna bring uh, the Haynes family back in live because they have a great question. So I'm gonna let uh, that be asked live. Yeah, hi again, guys. Um, yeah, my, my son over in Woodridge is saying, can the water currents down there move the shipwreck? That is a great question. I'm gonna turn that one over to uh, Dr. Kristen Meyer-Kaiser. Can the water currents move the shipwreck? or natural forces move shipwrecks. Um, I'm aware of one case in Massachusetts Bay where there was a wreck, the stern was in a known location, and then after a big storm, some shipwreck hunters went back out to dive it, and it was in a different location. It was close by, but had shifted a little. In the case of the Portland, um, we definitely have some natural degradation happening. There's erosion as you get the fast current sweeping over the site, and because it's a wooden wreck, it degrades over time. So I don't think that the Portland's likely to get knocked over by a water current, um, at least for the next several years until it becomes a little weaker. But there definitely are cases where natural forces, including water currents, can shift or alter shipwrecks. Uh, another great question. Uh, I want to bring in another question from our third graders in North Carolina. Um, they're joining live via Zoom with their uh, teacher, and they're wondering um, what kind of clues have, have, have you found either the previous time or this time um, as to why the Portland might have sank? And then what clues are you looking for right now to discover uh, the cause? That is a great question. And I'm going to turn that over again to Dr. Myers. So Kelvin, what kind of clues were you looking for in 2019 and 2020 for identifying and finding more out about the Portland and its story? And are there clues that you're looking for in the future to help find out more information about the Portland? And maybe this is a great time to introduce what tomorrow and Thursday's live programs are going to be about as well. Well, that is a great question, and it speaks really to, right to the heart of archaeology. So I'm, I'm really happy and pleased to hear that question, uh, because the ultimate mystery is what happened to the Portland and what caused it to sink. Last year, we had our first looks uh, at the shipwreck in 500 feet for the first time, really, in, in about 10 years. And so we were really getting to know the wreck. And this year, we went back with that knowledge to really investigate the engine. If you think of your car engine, um, and all the things that can kind of break down on a car engine, same thing on a steamship. We wanted to know, possibly did an axle break or what is called a connecting arm or a crank arm, the thing, the mechanism that made the side wheels, uh, the paddle wheels turn around. And with experience and even better technology this year, we had a beautiful look at the what's called the walking beam where we saw the, um, the paddle rod broken and this possibly is what stopped the paddle wheel from moving and caused it to sink. It also could have happened when it came to the bottom and broke apart. So what we're looking for right now, in fact, the PP is out there and doing an investigation is going inside the wreck, which has never been done. And we're looking for the fuel. This steamship ran on coal and it was the energy of the 19th century, moved all these steamships around and we're curious if it ran out of fuel, just like a car does. And we're looking at the storage or the coal bunker, see if it's completely out of fuel. And if it was, that might tell us that they just simply didn't have any more to put into the engines or the boilers. So we're trying to do hypothesis testing. Archeology span is a different type of science, but we have some questions out there. And it's really trying to solve mysteries. And tomorrow, 
and Thursday, we have our biggest mystery yet, a unidentified sailing ship that sank with no history written about it, really no identifiable features that are so obvious. You're like, aha, Titanic, Portland, big name ships. It's a coal schooner, which means it was a sailing vessel with about three masts carrying a lot of coal, kind of a semi-truck of the day. It was doing what needed to be done. And it went down and we have artifacts, little tantalizing clues. And one thing that's fun about being an archeologist is, you know, you're kind of that crime scene detective, but you've shown up 200 or 100 years after it. So tomorrow and Thursday, we'll be doing more programming where we go out and try to solve the mystery of this uh, unknown, unidentified uh, mystery collier, as we're calling it. And we hope you uh, join us as well. And uh, I think uh, I, I'll turn it back to you on that, Hannah. Yeah, that was a great intro to this week's live programming. And I'm super excited to see the discoveries we might be able to make as an entire team with the mystery schooner. So I think we have time for one more question, Joe. So do you want to pick, pick on someone? Absolutely, I definitely do. I noticed that we have a couple of these questions that have come in about the deterioration of the wreck. So is it mostly wood uh, or metal? Is it have rusticles like on the Titanic? Are there bacteria uh, that are working away on the wreck? Can we talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, the wreck has been deteriorating? Obviously it went down quite some time ago. Right, that is a great question. So again, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Myers. We have a question about deterioration of the Portland. How is it deteriorating? It's in 500-ish feet of water and it's salt water, cold up here in New England. What's the deterioration like? Um, it's, it, it's a, so first let's uh, address, it's made of wood. Um, the ship was built up in Maine and the tradition was still, you know, uh, timber and wood design and mostly oak, very thick planks. As it came down, a lot of what you would see in, you know, above water, like where the passengers slept, the staterooms, all the superstructures were knocked off either by waves or actually upwelling of air, kind of like popping a balloon. As it went down, all that water was pushing the air out. And what happens is a phenomenon where it kind of explodes the top pieces. So what we have is about 30 feet of the bottom structure where you would find a lot of the cargo, a lot of um, the engine pieces. And for most of the history, it held up really, really well, all things considering it kind of reached a thing of uh, a situation of stabilization. And then what we've found recently is that with human impacts, um, the deterioration has picked up in places such as the stern and a little bit of fun at the bow. And we're not quite sure on how fast this deterioration is now uh, going to occur. And one of the reasons we're out there is for management questions like that, trying to understand the impacts within the last 10 years, the last two years. So it, it has these cycles of reaching a stable, kind of a, a stabilization point, and then some type of impact changes the status quo, and you have a, a period of rapid deterioration. And that's one of the reasons we need that baseline and uh, comparative data that we're going out and collecting right now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. And Joe, I'll turn it over to you before I wrap up. If you have any final words to share from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, I first want to give a shout out to all the groups tuning in uh, live via Facebook and YouTube from across uh, not only the U.S., but Canada as well. And great to have a little international action with Dubai as well. Um, and, you know, huge shout out to the whole team. What a great uh, kickoff to day one. I can't wait for day two and three. So again, 11.30 a.m. Eastern, uh, join us on Facebook, join us on YouTube. We are going for a little mystery. I think you framed that really well. We're gonna dive on a mystery wreck. And I, for one, am pretty darn excited to, to see what we see. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. We're also looking forward to those 11.30 programs with Exploring by the Sea Your Pants tomorrow and again on Thursday. We also have more opportunities to connect, but just through the chat feed, those will be streamed on our websites and on our social media channels today at 2.30 and 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then tomorrow and Wednesday, we will be at the Mystery Collier site. Again, tomorrow, 2.30 and 6.30, and then on Thursday at just 2.30. So if you want to keep tuning in, see what the live feed is looking at, and hear from our research team, you have plenty of opportunities to connect. So with that, I also want to say to 
Find out more information on our websites. Both the sanctuaries.noaa.gov and the HUI website have more information about the project, including information on last year's project as well. And also you can follow along with, it, with this mission with the hashtag Stellwagen Deep Dive across all of our social media channels. I wanna send a huge thank you to the research team at Situate for sharing all of their knowledge with us today. To all of you for tuning in live and asking such terrific questions. To the team here at the Inner Space Center for making all of this happen, all of these connections. And also to the team that's on the research vessel Catapult that's operating the ROVs, sharing the live feed with us. Very special to be able to partake in this exploration in real time. So with that, I want to say thank you for tuning in and I hope to see you again throughout the programs we have the rest of the week.